Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Felix, and I'm here with Meher Roy today. Today, we're speaking with Colin Myers and Ocean Kain, who are the co-founders of Obo Labs. Obo is building software to enable distributed operation of validators, starting on Ethereum. Hi, Ocean, and hi, Colin, and welcome to Epicenter. Hey, guys. Thanks for having us. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, so uh, both of you actually were, were in touch for like a long time. You've both been in the space and in in staking, especially uh, for a while. So, you know, as is customary on, on Epicenter, we'd love to uh, first get an introduction to how you how you got into crypto and, and how you got to where you are today. Uh, maybe Colin, you can you can start. Yeah, cool. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having us again. Um, I have been watching and observing epicenter for, from a distance and always wondered when we'd get our shot um, so yeah happy happy it finally came definitely on the longer end of the spectrum uh based on my expectation set but yeah happy we finally made it happen uh yeah so quick quick background on me actually non-developer by background uh used to work on wall street worked at a variety of different banks um mostly in like credit and debt and got involved with Ethereum community, uh, 2017, I was living in New York and, you know, lucky for me, there was consensus and there was Joe Lupin and there was meetups and you know, there was different stuff happening. And at, at this point in my life, like 2017, I was trying to spend a lot of time, you know, trying to work at a hedge fund or a private equity firm or actually honestly just totally lost. It's still like what I was supposed to do. Um, and there was two things going on at that point in time. One of them was WeWork and the other one was crypto in New York. And those were like the two main things that everyone was buzzing about and work worked and trying to get a job there, um, but also spent most of my time on Ethereum. Um, 2017, I met Joe Lubin at a meetup, I uh, was inspired to quit my job. So I did. Um, then I joined Consensus in 2018 and I worked there for about three and a half years. Um, at Consensus was able to work on a lot of different technologies, even like space and blockchain um, and some crazy stuff like that but primarily focused on staking. Um, I started a project called Token Foundry, uh, which was like an early mover in the space to helping networks launch and trying to do compliant token launches. Um, turned that project into a project called Activate, um, which was recently sunset by uh, Codify, something we actually partnered with on Chorus One in the early days. Um, and throughout those time periods, I, I, I spent a lot of independent time contributing to ETH2, I uh, was involved in early working groups after DevCon 4, and I primarily at the beginning focused on the economics of ETH2. Um, they were not very well understood, and my job was to help enable the understanding of the economics um, for your at-home validators, for your larger scale validators, your exchanges, people like you know Coinbase and Consensus, and these different types of actors. Those initial work streams led to a lot of different enablement projects around the Genesis event. So the, the majority of my time was, was spent around the Genesis event and enabling that to take place. Um, while at Consensus, we built the ETH2 Launchpad, uh, which is the sole individual place where your at-home validators interact with the deposit contract and spent quite a bit of time with the client teams and helped them with user feedback. Um, and ultimately, all of these research projects culminated um, and what today is now DBT. Um, 2019, uh, Doc Rafice and Carl B started a research group uh, focused on trust minimized staking. Uh, and uh, Marsh Mead and myself were, were the first to, to come in to help enable that effort. Um, got completely sucked down the rabbit hole on DBT. Um, thought it was uh, world changing technology three years ago. No one had any idea what we were talking about. Um, it was uh, kind of grossly underfunded. Um, as an effort, and ultimately the, the only way that we found proper funding to turn DBT into a project was by Oshin and I both quitting our jobs respectively um, and going out and you know raising capital on our own and finishing the effort and putting the group of people together to make the technology a reality. So yeah, that's me. Um, thanks for having me on. I'm an ETH Maxi. Um, loving Cosmos these days though. Uh, but yeah, really excited about it. Um, and then yeah, to give my background, I'm a software developer by background, and in fact, I'm the fortunate person who's like second generation internet entrepreneur. My parents have run web companies most of my life. Um, 
So yeah, I would have grown up around kind of original website building, web design in the like late 90s, early noughties. Um, saw kind of SaaS companies built in the kind of noughties and 2010s. Um, out of college, I worked as a consultant and kind of discovered crypto in 2017 and got my first kind of full-time role in 2018 when Consensus opened an office in Ireland. Um, I did two years there in their tokenization department. We did some projects where we tokenized securities for French real estate on mainnet back in 2019 before that was prohibitively expensive to do on mainnet. And I left Consensus in March 2020 and I incorporated myself as a, a self-employed kind of contractor. I got picked up by Blockdemon to do ETH2 research for them. Back in 2018, when the original ETH2 specs came out, my I wrote an article that was effectively quite critical of them at the time. It was 1,500 Ether minimum and slashing was fairly severe. And I was like, really dubious that this was going to be safe or make sense. And then, yeah, I kind of kept an eye on it, got involved with Block Demon, um, had been building it along and ended up building out their ETH2 stack for them by Genesis. And I'd say shortly after Genesis, I was first introduced to the idea of trustless validators by getting an invite to this uh, trustless validator community call that Colin and Mara were running. And at the time, I was kind of agonizing over having no ability to run a backup validator or do anything when one failed. And I was introduced to this technology and I was like, oh, it's high availability for validators. This is definitely going to be a thing. Everything in Web2 does this. And I was kind of an immediate convert. But yeah, I think Colin realizes not very many other people were. Um, and yeah, we, it took me maybe a few more months of kind of being involved. I was trying to make an NFT issuance kind of stack. I did some work trying to issue like rugby video NFTs with some kind of like famous rugby players that didn't really go to plan. And then, um, someone once approached me and asked me to make an ERC 20 token for, to represent stake. And I kind of counter pitched them and tried to make like NFTs to represent validators. Um, and then, yeah, it, it, I wasn't really very good at uh, selling any of this idea. I had a product, but I had no business uh, acumen. And I realized that uh, I wasn't really very cut out for the whole CEO role. So I reached out to one of the only business people I knew in the space, who was Colin, because a couple of people had been kind of pushing my, me his direction. And I was talking to him about what I was doing. He uh, showed me what he was working on and what he wanted to do with Obol. Took me a few weeks to get convinced that uh, it was not too hard to attempt. And yeah, I think we kind of started around April 2021 together. And here we are, maybe two odd years later, a bit more. Awesome. Yeah, that's a rich history you both have. And, and thanks for going so deep into it. I think, yeah, we personally also have worked a little bit on high availability validation. So like we're, we're both very excited about this episode. Uh, so yeah, keen to get into it, right? So I guess maybe we can start there. We already mentioned DBT a bit. Maybe can you explain, you know, what, what is distributed validator technology? Yeah, cool. I'll, I'll give kind of the more macro perspective as to like the difference between a normal validator and then um, Ocean can get a bit more into like technical architecture and deployment and stuff. So um, today a validator consists of three pieces. Um, it is a public private key pair. Uh, it is a machine. And it is an agent. An agent we look at as an individual or an entity. So it's three things. And all of those are super monolithic. Uh, and that's just the validator stack of today uh, from an Ethereum perspective. What DBT enables is a more modular validator stack. And now what happens post DBT is you have key shares, not just one public private key pair. You have a collection of key shares, um, as many as you'd like to create based on your trust you know, properties, essentially. The next piece is, is that those key shares then can go on multiple machines, not just one machine, but multiple machines. And then third and lastly, this validator can be run by a group of people or a group of entities. So it, it takes your modular validator today, super monolithic, and it takes it to the more modular version where you can have multiple key shares, it increases your security, you can have multiple machines, it increases your availability, and you can have multiple people or entities, therefore it increases kind of your game theory or decreases the chances of Byzantine behavior for that validator. Uh, and I'll give it to Oshin and he can go more into kind of the technical talk. Yeah, I think an epicenter podcast is maybe one of the only places where I can talk about the like nerdier details of this rather than the high level idea. But yeah, I think one of the interesting things about it or what 
you know, makes these distributed validators more possible than they might otherwise be is the cryptography that Ethereum 2, I should, we should probably stop saying the word ETH2 uses, proof of stake Ethereum, uh, and that's the BLS signature scheme. What's fancy about the BLS signature scheme is it's one of the first sign like elliptic curve signature schemes where if you have, you know, independent signatures all for the same hash, you can actually like add them together in a low trust environment. You don't need the original private key to do so. So what happens, as Colin alluded to, is, you know, you want to set up a distributed validator. The first thing you probably do is a distributed key generation, unless you want to just split a normal key locally. But it's better if you kind of do one with a, a DKG. Then at the end of that process, there's, you know, let's call it four machines to keep it easy, um, each with a piece of the private key on it. And you have a piece of software in the middle of your validator stack between your like consensus client and your validator client. And it, these four nodes can like, connect to one another over like TCP. And they more or less play a little consensus game to decide on what they're going to sign every time that there's a, a validator duty coming up. They you know, play a little consensus game, pick this is the hash we're going to sign. And then every validator client is given the exact same you know, hash to sign. They all, you know, check it for slashing rules, do all the usual things. What's nice is everyone gets to keep their own private key management. Um, you know, the Obel software is just kind of read only as a middleware. It doesn't actually have the power to sign anything. Um, so all of the independent validators check that nothing's slashable. Once they're happy, they sign it with their piece of the private key and they broadcast it to what it looks like their consensus client. And then in the middle there, um, our software like intercepts them, shares them around with the other machines. And once any of, in this instance, like a four node cluster, once three of them, like uh, the three of the signatures are together, you can combine them into a full valid signature for the validator and you can send that onwards to the network. And what's neat about that is you don't need all four signatures. You actually can have fault tolerance. And this is kind of one of the super important things about high availability is if you put, you know, a validator on four machines, but you need all four of them to be online, you're more brittle than you would otherwise be. But if you put it in four machines and you know only need three to be online, this is where things really start to change. And you can have high uptime, you can do rolling restarts, you can replace hardware that fails without downtime, and you know, all of those good things and are kind of unlocked with distributed validators. So uh, from a user perspective, if I'm a staker, generally the options I have today is I can um I can either put it into a liquid staking protocol, the Lidome would be the biggest of them. I could go to a specialized validator shop uh, like a Block Demon or Chorus, and I could spin up all P2P when I could spin up my validators there. Or if I'm usually technically competent, then, then I can run my own validator. Uh, I'm actually curious, kind of, in these three three kind of segments, let's imagine that being liquid staking as one segment, the other being the specialized validator, that's like hosting validators for you if you have 32 ETH. Third segment being um, you want to run your validators at home. Um, how would these three segments kind of use this technology and what difference would it make for them? Yeah, it's a, yeah that's a good question. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about like our adoption path so far. Um, the earliest adoption of Oval has been at-home validators. They're the first ones to have put it on mainnet. Uh, we put our first ones, you know, on mainnet between core team members all running at home. Um, and now kind of the adoption evolution is now getting into your hosted person uh, and, you know, your liquid staking pool. Liquid staking pools were kind of the earliest um, adopters of the idea and supporters of it being in their roadmap. Um, so the, I'll start with the at-home validator, uh, which is quite interesting. So today the at-home validator, for example, like Oshin runs, runs one out of his house and like we travel a lot today for, per, for, for like purposes of oval. Um, and it's always, it's like kind of chronically offline. It, it's kind of this, this thing that you have to worry about and you can't really have peace of mind for being an at-home validator today. Uh, which is something that like DVT can unlock for you, right? You can have your at-home machine. Uh, you can run backups inside of the cloud in a non-slashable way uh, so that you can ensure you can kind of live your normal life. Um, the other side of the at-home validator is the persona type of, I don't have 32 ETH, but I trust myself to run my own machine. 
And there's actually like quite a lot of those people. Uh, and they can use Obol to come together to like create their own shared validator because they may not be interested in taking on the risk of the pool. And, you know, they may not need a liquid stake token, but they don't have 32 ETH. Uh, and that's kind of this squad staking concept, which, which we've seen uh, honestly take off quite a bit in the at-home validator category, which is, you know, a whole group of people who's like, you know, some of my ETH is in a pool, the rest of it, I just want to run myself, but I don't have a full validator's worth. Uh, which has been quite interesting. So yeah, it's peace of mind. But then that second user group is actually where we think most of the tail end adoption for DVT will be in like 10 to 15 years is like enabling just groups of people to get together to run their own machines and giving each other fault tolerance in like a human to human manner. Um, so yeah, a lot of early adoption there, but the middle adoption of DVT won't be there in my opinion. They're like the early enthusiasts. They're the ones that help set us up. Uh, our primary duty is to figure out how to give the at-home validator more tools to get more of them online. Uh, and now we're bridging more into the hosted and like liquid staking full category. So now I'll get into those two different types of users and you know why it's beneficial for them. Um, for your liquid staking pool, uh, it is actually the most innovative use case of DBT today uh, because most of the pools are using it for its Byzantine properties. Uh, which is quite cool. So the example I like to give is, let's just you know use a hypothetical liquid staking pool. Today, there's 10 validators inside of this liquid staking pool. All of them are supplying their own you know, keys uh, to the system, keys that they create, keys that they manage, and keys that they run on their machines, again, in a very monolithic environment. And the reality is, is that like in each, in, in this liquid, like this hypothetical liquid staking pool, each of those validators would have like a certain amount of stake that they're responsible for. Uh, and that person can actually self slash. They can be, you know, they can sabotage, they can act malicious. They can't take the funds, right? But they can shut the machines off and they can like bring penalty to the greater pool, if you will, when most of these pools use social economics. So it does mean that like it could take you know, it, it'll, it'll hurt every single participant in the pool uh, if one of these validators defects. And, and it doesn't even need to be malicious, right? It could also be a bad day at the office where like, you know, all your servers crash and everything goes down, or it could even be catastrophic, right? Like you have a rogue employee who steals the keys and, you know, there, there's a variety of different things that can happen inside of that construct. So what DVT en enables is that that group of 10 people can now just share one validator which like creates this whole new defect game theory between the different operators in that cluster. It gives fault tolerance and it, it makes it essentially, I hate to use the word impossible, but it makes it very, very difficult for any one validator in that group to do anything malicious or defective to that pool. Um, so that again, like it's availability and slashing protection reasons and utilizing it for the fact that there's a consensus mechanism uh, and it prevents Byzantine behavior. Uh, so it's one of its true you know, core primitives. Uh, the other reasons that they're using it is not only for that, but they're using it as well to decentralize their validator set. So if you're going to build a liquid staking pool that wants to be very decentralized, then you're going to have to invite, uh, call it middle to lower to sub-tier validators to like decentralize the validator set over time. And you need to do so in a way that protects the pool, especially if it's an existing pool. Uh, and most of the pools today, like migrating to DBT, are existing pools, and, and there's lots of money inside of all of them, right? Um, so if you are going to let new validators in, you need to let them enter the pool in a manner that doesn't hurt the pool. And DBT is a great way to do that because you can just build some shared validators. You can partner, you know, three highly proficient people with one newcomer. And then, you know, you have some fault tolerance. There's some give there um, if they make an error without really harming the pool. Um, so, yeah, the decentralization of the validator set is, is also a very interesting one for pools and the use of it for its Byzantine properties. Um, your hosted service provider is actually someone that we thought would come later in the adoption cycle. Uh, however, they've come in quite quickly. Um, and it, it's a factor to do with uh, the centralized staking product or the hosted product is it was the first product in the industry. Uh, it, it's been competitive for a number of years now. It's like entering its fairly normal maturation cycle of compressed margins and increased costs. Uh, and now those products like need to 
mature themselves in a way where they decrease their cost, but they improve their security as being a centralized provider like requires um, SOC 2, SOC 1 compliance. These things help to kind of institutionalize yourself. And, and most of these people have to offer some type of off-chain insurance mechanism, uh, w- which is quite costly to do, or, or you just have to be pretty well you know, bankrolled. So for, for these users, their maturation and growth is meeting DVT kind of in the middle. Uh, and they're experimenting with it to help scale their operations in a way where they can decrease the amount of machines they need for a certain amount of ETH while also increasing the security profile of that setup. Um, we've seen a lot of interesting things recently in the insurance and reinsurance topic around DBT. Offering staking insurance it has been difficult historically because you know, the definition of a bad day at the office is losing all your ether potentially. Uh, but that was just at the beginning. And, and now we're, as a community, DVT being one of those technologies, building things that like alleviate a worst case scenario of like, you know, losing all your ETH. So uh, insurance providers have been interested in kind of including DVT into their criteria of providing insurance because it gives them more assurance uh, that like, you know, you can't lose all of it. It's it's not an absolute loss situation. So, you know, no, no insurer is going to insure something that's an absolute loss situation. Uh, and technologies like DVT have now come in and helped like alleviate that. So yeah, those are the three core user groups. I, I think the fourth one I'll mention um, is kind of DeFi and how DeFi has uh, thought about uh, using DVT. So like in most DeFi projects today, you're like taking an asset and you're wrapping it or you're taking a collection of assets and you're pooling them together and uh, you may produce a stable coin from it, right? Or you may produce other streams of yield or income off of a collection of tokens. Uh, The collection of tokens that people are using today are LST tokens, liquid stake tokens, uh, and they're doing a variety of different things with them. Um, those products, since there's a product built on top of it, it's better for those products if those liquid stake tokens are as de-risked as possible. And now people are looking at what is their risk criteria. And mostly they haven't been looked at. The only risk criteria that an LST token has been looked at to date is liquidity, because that was the biggest risk, right? How liquid is this thing? Like, what does that look like? But, but now it's more or less like, okay, what are the potential penalization properties Uh, of these LSTs and under the hood, like what types of security protocols and parameters are they using for it? So now we've seen DeFi who has like its own interpretation of risk, honestly, probably a more mature interpretation of risk than the validating community. And now DBTs kind of come into their spectrum over the past, call it month or two, uh, which has been very interesting for for them to want to include it in their ecosystem and, and, and to learn more about it. One of the downsides of a DVT-like setup is that it adds extra cost. Meaning, meaning, what's the what's the other case? Let's say you have a hosted service provider, and uh, they're running a validator on some some cloud, probably Amazon or Google, and they have an engineer there for uptime, and they're running it on a single machine. They won't have a 100% uptime, but they will get to somewhere higher than 99% uptime just on, 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 on that setup. Now, when a, when a DVT setup comes into the picture, um, you're running like three or four machines and usually spread across different parties. And you're also adding some kind of key setup and key teardown cost, right? Like the, probably the setup of these systems uh, will need some extra extra work. It's one of these cases where you're adding fault tolerance, um, but you're adding cost. And s- sometimes the cust- customer cannot perceive the extra fault tolerance, meaning that they'll go to some kind of log explorer that will say, hey, what are the returns of the validators? And the validator with 99% up percent uptime running on one machine, their return will be X. And then they'll see the DVT setup and it might be marginally better like X plus, you know, 0.1% or 0.05%. How do you kind of address that, uh, address that issue? And uh, do you see that issue in, in, in practice? And uh, what does it mean for the different parties and who might adopt DVD? 
I love this question because um, it actually pushed back a little on an increasing cost. You're right in that it increases hardware, but depending on what people have done beforehand, it doesn't necessarily increase their cost. And what I'm kind of getting at, and you kind of talked about it in the cloud, is um, originally without distributed validators, um, the real problem was that there was more or less no safe way to run a backup. Um, the only kind of option you had was do some sort of monitoring game and pray that your monitoring is, you know, um, perfectly reliable and there's not a scenario where you turn on two machines with the same private key at the same time. Um, and the problem with not being able to run a backup is um, it can be very hard to recover from a failure, um, particularly if you want to use something like a bare metal machine in like a data center somewhere that's usually one of the more low cost ways to run a server. And the problem is if you do put, you know, particularly a large amount of private keys on a bare metal server like that, and it just goes offline, which is regular occurrence will probably happen at least once or twice a year. Um, you just kind of have to sit in your hands. There's more or less nothing safe you can do at that point. You, well, you can try and bring up a backup and hope to shut down the backup before the primary comes back, or you can ring up the data center and ask them to kind of go and like pull the plug out the wall. Um, but this not being able to like run a backup, um, has changed a lot how people have, you know, built their architectures in the early years. Um, most of these centralized, I say most, that's not quite true. A lot of centralized providers at least started running in the cloud, um, particularly because then if you do have a, a failure of your machine, you can kind of detach the disk. You know, it's, it's all in software. You have a lot of power to kind of actually recover things that you don't have when it's just a, a server sitting somewhere. Um, but the problem with that, and you kind of alluded to the fact that they might run one machine, a lot of people they'll have at least a, a few servers in the cloud. Normally they'll have kind of at least two that runs kind of ELs and CLs, um, which is kind of the, the meat of it. Then they'll have a machine with their validator on it. And plausibly they'll have some more with a key manager on it as well. So a lot of people like kind of enterprise staking validators, you're talking kind of three to seven cloud servers. Um, and cloud servers are much more expensive than a bare metal server rule of thumb think about 10x more including one of the real kickers is bandwidth costs which i'm sure you guys are familiar with with egress but that can often take up 30 percent of the kind of operating cost of a cloud validator so you start to pile on egress multiple cloud machines and so on and it really starts to end up kind of costly and that's kind of maybe one way to have, you know, high uptime without distributed validators is to kind of put it all in the cloud, have a bit of failover and, and do things that way. The other option that some routes go down is they kind of do the hardware route where they'll buy a particular server that has dual CPU sockets. So they have two CPUs, they have a RAID array of disks. So if even one disk fails, no problem. They'll have dual networking cards. So, you know, if there's problems there, they'll survive maybe dual PSUs, but these PCs cost in the tens of thousands of dollars and they're not particularly cheap. So either, you know, trying to get kind of fault tolerance by using cloud services or fault tolerance by using really expensive hardware, both of these are, you know, not as cheap as you expect. A lot of, you know, some of these stacks, if you're running seven machines in the cloud, you wouldn't feel spending a couple thousand, maybe three, four thousand a month for something like that. And if you then have distributed validators, um, and you can have private keys like split into groups. It opens up the ability to more safely put validators on bare metal machines because if one of your four machines dies, no big problem. It'll stay online. You can kind of wait for it to come back. If it doesn't come back, you can bring up another, you know, partial on another node. It's not going to cause a slashing. It doesn't have a full key on its own. All of these machines are doing consensus beforehand. So kind of what we talk to a lot of these centralized providers that are like, how could, you know, distributed validators possibly not increase my cost. Um, we tell them that, you know, with software fault tolerance, you can move away from like cloud-based solutions. You can move away from having like extremely, you know, fancy hardware-based solutions to have high uptime. And instead you can move towards commodity bare metal and use just fault tolerance to do it. So instead of having, you know, f four to seven, 400 bucks a month nodes that run in the cloud, you can have, you know, $100 a month bare metal machines and your full stack can cost 400 a month instead of 4K a month. Um, and yeah, the, the last kicker of that is, can you do it at scale with high load? And we're you know, running a lot of good tests in that regard, seeing if we can do this at like, you know, thousands of keys as well to, to improve margins. But yeah, naively in the scenario, yes, you're running more than one node, but 
bar the home staker, most enterprises, most, you know, operators within the LSPs, they're not running a single machine unless they're, you know, doing something with very fancy hardware. They're probably running at least a few machines. So distributed validators and having fault tolerance allows them to kind of, yeah, use cheaper servers, less, you know, not over over provision them as much. And we're reasonably comfortable bar, you know, the people that are already running on bare metal have a very low cost basis. There's a very large amount of validator operators that we speak to that DVT actually will let them reduce their costs, even if they are running more hardware. I think your question, Mayor, as well, kind of presents the the sell of DVT, you know, today. Because look, at the end of the day, it's a security protocol. It's not a yield protocol, which is like what everyone wants everything to be, right? Everyone wants to hear like, I'm not using your thing unless it makes me more money, right? Um, and like for us, the fact of the matter is, is that it's a security protocol today. And maybe there's ways that it can get a validator to become more profitable, but but it's not this lottery mechanism that you download onto your node and then one day you see 200 ETH sitting in your account. It's, it's not one of those things. Um, so getting people to adopt it, yes, has taken quite some time. Um, but there's a reason for that because it is a security protocol. So um, it's supposed to give you other things uh, that benefit you in the event that there's an increased cost for it. However, we we think to Oshin's points that uh, it's not only a benefit to them on the security front, but it will actually probably save them money on a relative basis today. And then in the future time period, it's up to us to kind of standardize DBT as a configuration. Uh, and what we like to use internally is that we've been calling this like the Obel inside strategy, like similar to Intel, right? Like what Intel was able to do is like basically standardize it's the inclusion of their chip into like everything. And then the machines and the software and everyone else, you know, were the competitive market. Uh, we think getting like Obel on the inside of these things is far more where it sits because it's a security protocol. So like, how do you position a security protocol in a time one, during a bear market, and two, in an industry where, like, you know, everyone's looking for yield. Right. Yeah, amazing. I think, yeah, we talked about a little bit now the sort of cost from the operator side. I guess there's also Obel as this middleware that obviously you guys are developing. You're spending a lot of resources on, on developing this, and you also raised money. So um, there's also, like, an expectation, obviously, of this having some sort of business model. Maybe if... if whatever you can share in terms of like how do you imagine uh, like sort of Obol to be adopted is it like the operators that would pay to to run Obol uh, is there like some other uh, models that you've thought of um, to to utilize or yeah yes yeah it's a good question so I'll tell like a little story here and have been fortunate enough to observe like how the ETH1 and ETH2 client teams like were developed and hardened and staffed and funded. Uh, and, and that's really kind of like the, the core of like how middlewares and Obel and others, you know, what types of monetary streams they'll be able to like take on and work with. So like the early foundation of Ethereum was, you know, there's five client teams, I think maybe six actually on the, on the POS side. And then I think maybe three or four, on uh, ETH one side. But anyways, these are all kind of, you know, privately bankrolled now. Uh, they're well-funded. It took years to get to this. They were funded by the EF and other like, you know, large donors. And that software uh, is free forever, right? So it's virally free. It's the primary network access to the Ethereum network. It has basic functionality, um, but it's going to be free forever. And now, like, you know, Danny Ryan uses the words like ossification and crystallization. And really what that means is that like the amount of innovation that takes place at that core client level and funding is going to lessen and lessen over time. And new innovative space needs to be opened elsewhere. And now the new, like the new innovative space that's being opened elsewhere is, is being enabled in this middleware layer. So now we have this whole new middleware market uh, where there'll be a variety of different protocols who are coming to add complementary software to the core Ethereum stack. And that middleware layer today has private funding, but tomorrow can, cannot 
have private funding forever, right? There's like, uh, there has to be a way for these middleware protocols to maintain themselves, but also continue the ethos of giving back and having regenerative economics. So today we think that optimism has taken that responsibility. It, it, it is a responsibility at the end of the day, if you're building at this level, is to try to figure out how you can make circular economics of some sort. Um, so the way that optimism has like built their network and started their ecosystem, having a fee, which comes in that is then donated retroactively as a community to other projects that support the core Ethereum staking stack. So this is, you know, people like a protocol guild. These are people like eStaker. This is Gitcoin. There's a variety of, right, these like uh, projects that require funding to maintain themselves on a different level of being open source. And Obol and DBT sits at this new low enough layer that like we believe it's our responsibility to utilize retroactive public goods in some sort of way uh, is the primary way that we start the economic machine. Uh, where it goes after that, you know, is to be determined. Um, but there's a way for us to kind of use that economic model with every validator type, which is also the important thing. That economic model works with your at-home validator. The economic model works with your hosted person. And it also works with your liquid staking pool and what other other future you know topic uh, or use case that comes about. So yeah, t- today we're, we're most focused on what is the version of retroactive public goods that works for Opal. Um, right now we're like learning and figuring this out through this main net adoption time period. You know, Opal's totally free today. DBT is completely free. You can go and, you know, play with it, do whatever you want. Um, but like tomorrow, how do we bridge into like a circular economic system? Uh, and that's our biggest focus today. I'm, I'm actually curious if, if you think the ideal place to house this kind of middleware stack, I mean, the specifications of it might be actually something like the Ethereum foundation itself. And then the client teams actually implement this middleware as part of their as part of their code bases. Yeah, so this is this is Opal V2. Uh, today we are on our roadmap to V1. At the moment, we're we're about 60, 70 percent to V1, but we've been working on a parallel work stream, which is Opal V2. And Opal V2 um, Pro, like further protocolizes DBT by turning it into a specification. Um, so we, we've actually partnered with Nethermind uh, for, for them to, to be the second core development team for the Obel network. Uh, and they will be leading and partnering with the Obel Labs current core development team for the Obel network to work on the research and specification uh, of the Obel V2 protocol. Uh, and we are pushing towards a spec-driven environment where we hope to incentivize a variety of different implementations, right, for different people's use cases. Um, and the reason that we're also doing that is to kind of the, the prior story that I told, which is you need to be as close to the base layer from a variety of different perspectives as possible. One of them is roadmap. You have to keep your roadmap on. You can't get in front of the mothership's roadmap. You got to kind of hang out in this Goldilocks time period. And yeah, those are those are the most important things that you have to follow and kind of stay on top of. Yeah, the one extra thing I want to add actually about the middleware side, or as you said, like why don't the client teams implement it, you know, directly? This is something we looked at ourselves for, for quite a while. And it's actually why I touched on BLS signatures being aggregatable, being so important. And I'll talk about it kind of by way of talking about Mev Boost and before that even Mev Get. Um, so for those of you that aren't familiar, Mev Boost is now the product like run by Flashbots that allows, you know, people that want to get, you know, inclusion into blocks uh, without getting front run. Um, they kind of talk to validators through the software. But before it was called Mev Boost, it was called Mev Get. And it was just a, like a slight modification to the original Get code base. And they were like highly successful in their rollout. More or less, all of the Ethereum miners back in the day were running MevGet to the point that people are concerned it was north of 90% of clients. And the Ethereum Foundation were kind of concerned about this. They were like, okay, if there's, you know, anything goes wrong with the software, you know, almost everyone is running it. So when it came time to move towards um, ETH2 and reinventing it to figure out how it works in this new paradigm with validators, one of the 
best changes they made was to re-architect MevGet instead of it being like a forked client, it's an optional middleware or more accurately a sidecar that all of the clients can add. And rather than it being, you know, a feature that only one specific client has and the others don't, it was something that they could all opt into. And this, you know, massively de-risked it and allowed it to be more accessible and didn't, you know, prevent client diversity in any way. And we had kind of a similar like issue when we were developing distributed validators as well. The easiest kind of way to make an MVP is to make a standalone validator client that has, you know, arbitrary power to sign. You can build your distributed system to go and run validators this way. Whereas, um, yeah, the, the kind of problem here is either you have, you know, one client that's super successful and it works, or you have a spec that everyone has to implement. But if you do that, you kind of really slow your roadmap. You kind of have to get everyone to march along at the same time. And you really don't have much optionality. If a new, better version comes along, people can't switch to it very easily. So in the interest of, you know, not, you know, causing harm while trying to do good when it comes to building distributed validators, we realized that we could also build distributed validators as a middleware because of BLS signatures being aggregatable. So um, right now, all of the existing validator clients, they can add our software into their stack and become a distributed validator more or less with no changes. And this is super beneficial because it does allow, you know, you're not one client or, you know, replacing them all. Or if there is, you know, a better spec comes out or, you know, Obal, you know, goes to zero in the morning, a new one can come along. All the clients can just put in a new middleware and it's much more modular and it's much more like, fault tolerant in that regards that you know if something goes wrong you know no big deal people can kind of pivot and this you know design idea is why we kind of went towards the middleware route and it's you know something that's kind of served us well in that regard but the last leg of it is you know just one implementation of the middleware is you know sufficient from a safety perspective but there could still be a liveness risk if you know the thing has a bug and it goes offline that could be a problem so the kind of further leg of the journey is after you build it once, get some adoption, prove that it works, then it starts to become more sensible to protocolize it, make a spec, have a couple implementations. But even if there is just one, it is still modular, replaceable, and is this, you know, nice thing that if a better one comes along, no big deal, you know, it, it can be swapped out. So um, I think that is kind of an important design decision versus why isn't this, you know, a spec that all of the clients implemented because you can iterate faster, you can try more things, you can have more optionality. And, and that's kind of the way we've designed the software so far. Okay, cool. I guess we also wanted to sort of talk about how Obol interacts with other middlewares in the Ethereum stack. So you already mentioned like MathBoost here. I guess that that might be a good place to start where like in my imagination, right? Like I guess now we run this Obol cluster, like all of these uh, nodes in the cluster also run MathBoost. Do they have to make basically consensus on, on in terms of like what sort of block you accept there? Or can you talk a little bit about how, how this interaction works? Yeah. Um, so it's relatively straightforward because MevBoost talks to the consensus clients, whereas we're almost a little layer lower down talking to kind of validator clients. And you ask a good question about, do you have to kind of come to consensus on what's provided? Um, MevBoost is a bit different to, you know, a normal block proposal in that um, the fear is that if you have, um, you know, a block that's extracting a load of MEV, that's, you know, um, yeah, taking like an outsized reward, um, the searcher doesn't want to show the proposer exactly the full block because then the proposer will be like, oh, thanks for the alpha. I'm just going to rewrite this to send it to my address and I'm just going to propose it. And this was actually one of the reasons around the kind of redesign of, of MevBoost now when it moved towards proof of stake was if we want this to be available to every proposer, we need it to be low trust because, you know, in the... ETH1 world, there was only a handful of miners, so you could kind of trust them. Whereas in, you know, ETH2, the hope is that there's a huge amount of validators. So you do, this does need to be low trust. So what actually happens is the relay in the situation is actually the kind of trusted party. They have the full block. They know, you know, what it is and they promise, you know, not to rug or like un undermine the searchers and, and, you know, screw with them. So they just provide a hash, like, or like the header of a block to, the actual distributed validator. So 
at that point, yes, the nodes um, do come to consensus on, you know, what one to pick. But there is, you know, there's not too much they can go wrong. There's not a full block there. They can't reorder transactions. They can just say, hey, you know, this is a block editor. It's going to pay us this reward. Are we cool with it? And everyone says, yep, cool with it. Sign it and sends it back to the relay who then bro- appends the, the real block and sends it onwards. Um, so, yeah, that, that would be how the, the, mev, the mev boost kind of integration works. Um, do we want to talk about some of the other ones, maybe? Yeah, I guess the other thing we want to talk about here is also like sort of a trend that's uh, kind of coming up in Ethereum, right? Like restaking and, and eigenlayer, like sort of reutilizing your collateral or the Ethereum validators to offer additional services, like let's say maybe Oracle or whatnot. And uh, I guess that's also like, first of all, it's very hyped, I guess, but also seems to interact with with Obol on the front that, you know, um, yeah, how how could like restaking services be offered through Obol? I, I guess that, that would be something that I'm personally actually very interested in. For sure. Yeah, it, it's a great question and, and something we're chatting quite a lot about at the moment these days. So um, I talk about, so we're talking to them for the most part about a project called Eigenlayer, who's introduced this idea of restaking. And as far as how Obol fits into the equation, there's kind of two ways that we fit in. First, as a staker, which is, you know, the the kind of crux. These are the people that are, you know, um, pointing the withdrawal address of their validator at a, you know, an eigenlayer smart contract and opting in to be the restakers. Like, yes, you know, we will provide economic security for some extra, I think, additional validated services, what they're calling the, the other thing. And... From a staking perspective, we think distributed validators and OBOL is super important because if you are trying to, you know, sell your restaking solution to these other services that are, you know, buying economic security from you, um, you want to be extremely sure that the stake underneath you is safe and secure because if something goes wrong and they all get slashed, uh, your economic security kind of disappears. Um, Technically, you know, they'll be able to, you know, charge the person that gets slashed and they'll get penalized for it. But if you're, you know, maybe running an Oracle or something and depending on this, if there's a mass slashing under you, um, all the validators get exited. So your economic security just kind of disappears on you all of a sudden. And that's, you know, something that you can't really, or you really don't want to happen if you're trying to, you know, if you're, uh, you know, an additional validating service looking for, you know, economic security, you want to be sure that the validators beneath it is rock solid. So this is where distributed validators really kind of add benefit for the kind of restaking paradigm. It's like, yes, you know, this stake is run by groups of people. The odds of it being slashed are quite low. The odds of it going offline are quite low. And that kind of gives you a more firm base to actually provide guarantees to extra services. And then, you know, going a little further, OBOL itself could reward and penalize people within a distributed validator by using this kind of restaking and economic security. And this is, you know, the kind of further version of, you know, in, in the near term, OBOL can be a staker for something like Eigenlayer. But in the longer term, it can also be an additional validated service that's, you know, being the one paying for economic security or for, for restake to keep its, you know, protocol running. Um, so yeah, we, we're, you know, quite bullish on the idea of having distributed validators be a safe base to restake on. Yeah, that, that's that's really cool. I like personally was thinking, you know, also since, you know, I guess there could be a lot of additional services that um, are offered through Eigenlayer, right? And maybe for a single node operator, it can be hard to run so many additional services. So I guess, do you think it's possible that like, for example, a OBOL cluster sort of shares these responsibilities? Like one guy runs the Oracle, the other does... 100%. Right. Yeah. In the in the near term, there'd be a bit of trust involved. If you're, you know, saying, hey, we will put our withdrawal contract, you know, towards Eigenlayer. We'll trust Meher is going to run that Oracle for us. He's not going to get us slashed. Y- you can do that absolutely. And, you know, we, we could all be taking the risk of, you know, doing that extra additional voluntary service each. Um, but going even further, we're working on the cryptography to make kind of proofs of kind of you know fair participation more easily provable and here's a that the, the, like the longer term goal is that you know one piece of this distributed validator could opt into this service for everyone and if they do screw up 
they're the one that takes the the hit or eat, eats you know most of the blame rather than the whole group sharing in in the like slashing if if you know one person who they like trusted to you know do some extra service for them doesn't like match but yes you you, you absolutely can have you know one person in your cluster doing all of these extra validating services for you yeah maybe this eigen layer ecosystem will be so large that specialization of labor uh, will emerge meaning some validators do some things and other validators do other things and if that kind of specialization of labor emerges then oval is kind of perfectly fit for for exploiting that specification uh, specialization but it's still early days right like there's not not a single service that's actually running on this restaking uh, model in production so yeah i think they announced their no not in production they announced their spec and stuff i think this week so um shout out to them for that so yeah they're working away on it we're we're keeping an eye chat away is is the oval concept only applicable to ethereum because of its special staking model or is it also applicable to other chains could you expand to other chains and deliver utility yeah it's a good question so look we've been thinking about dvt for ethereum validators for three and a half years at this point so um i made it a pretty large effort at the end of last year to be like hey guys it's time uh we have to go look at where else we can go right like this technology most likely will benefit other ecosystems or other layers of Ethereum, for example. So we went on this effort to kind of go find problems recently. So we, we spent the entire fourth quarter um, and a good portion of the first quarter on a Cosmos effort, um, which you know the team at Course One was very helpful with and uh, a lot of the other Cosmos ecosystem as well. We've also, over time, when we did like our first and second fundraising round, kind of had this emphasis on like, what is a second ecosystem that we think there's smart people working in that have the right, you know, mission and like the right vision. And that was Cosmos investors. So uh, the ecosystem itself already has a pretty actually large Cosmos presence in it uh, today as, um, as Opal. Um, so we decided to double down on that fact because we had the best access to information and, and we figured we could like learn as quickly as possible, succeed quickly, fail quickly, kind of one of those, you know, mindsets. Um, so we went into Cosmos and we started looking for problems. Um, we spoke to the validators. We uh, spoke to the liquid staking projects. We spoke to the ICF. We spoke to the builders program. We kind of did this whole loop of going through the whole Cosmos ecosystem and speaking to people and looking for problems. Um, and we were able to identify, you know, a couple structural problems um, as to how uh, DBT could be useful for smaller validators, for example, in Cosmos to team up to get more delegation to enter the active set. Uh, there's kind of like this larger portion of Cosmos validators that are like chronically unprofitable. Even like some of the largest, uh, you know, Cosmos validators aren't necessarily that profitable uh, today either. So the smaller to, you know, middle tier ones, there's really no game for them unless they could maybe team up together, right? And attract delegation through, you know, means of using DVT. Um, so yeah, we found some good problems in Cosmos. We published a blog post on it recently. Um, you know, there's coordination difficulties to making it a reality. There's protocol difficulties. There's cryptography differences. For example, Cosmos does not use BLS signatures. Um, but we also learned through that effort that if you wanted to get it done, you could. Uh, and there's kind of like a, a existing versions in the Cosmos ecosystems that are about, you know, a, a third of what DBT is. Uh, but there would be a lot of build uh, inside of Cosmos that would be necessary. Um, one of the most interesting things that we found about Cosmos was actually the kind of social threshold of the value of dvt uh, and inside of cosmos what we realized is that there wasn't enough value at risk for people to think that it was something that shouldn't just be you know an open source primitive they couldn't believe that it needed to be a network with all these you know tools and education and funding and ecosystem around it um, but our take from that was is that the Cosmos ecosystem is almost mature enough to have enough value at risk for everyone to say like, hey, we, we think this is a good technology to adopt into our community. Um, so for, for us, we, we believe that it's a little bit early for DBT in Cosmos, but um, we are still actively like working on implementation-based research now. So 
we like stated the problems and now what we want to present to everyone is kind of like, here's how it could be implemented. Um, so yeah, that's like one area of alternative layer ones outside of Ethereum where our, our community is aligned and we're experimenting to see if the Cosmos community values it and then we'll you know collaborate with it. Um, the other area, which is actually super exciting, uh, Figment just put out a piece yesterday around distributed sequencer technology, uh, a new term that we're trying to coin. Uh, and this has been the other research area for us at Opal is just going up the stack and looking at your other actors, right? So today we've spent all this time on the validator. Well, let's go up to the block builder. Let's see if there's like centralization problems around block building. People talk about MPC block building, right? All these different constructs. And then we've also been looking at the sequencer and like the prover, the verifier, all of these new actors that are becoming more and more important in the core Ethereum infrastructure stack and looking at their adoption cycles and saying like, is there a need uh, or is there a reuse case for the work that we've done for distributed validators and all the stuff that you know, we've learned from an external project building it, not, not from a foundation perspective, actually which is the reality of where layer two is. They're a bit more mature in there. We sit outside the foundation, we do our own things and we do whatever. Um, so you know, collaborating with those new groups of people uh, has been quite an interesting experience for us. So yeah, we're, we're, we're actively looking at two different growth strategies for DVT to see if it can be helpful elsewhere. Uh, one of them is horizontal, uh, that's Cosmos. One of them is vertical, uh, that's going into the sequencer topic and seeing if our technology could be helpful there. Yeah, very interesting. I guess I would also like just like to hear your thoughts. I guess you're like very close in the end to like both the validator ecosystem and sort of the other protocols. And and I would just like sort of like to hear how you currently think of the the validator ecosystem and and how do you see it evolving. I mean, obviously, sort of like one of the core ideas of Ethereum is is that there are these home stakers. Like, do you do you think that like there are much of those and will this grow? Obviously, Obol potentially might help uh, increase that. But I guess just generally, what's your view of the space? Yeah, um, I've been surprised thoroughly at the number of like hybrid at-home validators, I, I, I would call them, right? They're basically like small groups of at-home validators who are starting small companies together. Uh, and, and there are tens and twenties and they're like growing by the number, right? We kind of call them like the tail end, uh, validator segment. Uh, and that's probably growing the most, right? We're, we're seeing a variety of new and small validator entities pop up. Um, we're starting to see people from other ecosystems come to Ethereum and by means of coming to Ethereum, they're doing so through DVT as actually their first knowledge base, uh, which was also like a very interesting thing. Is so now we're onboarding validators from other ecosystems, not into the core configuration, but into the DVT based configuration uh, from from the very beginning. Um, but are probably some of the most like bullish, honestly, and exciting conversations we have with people are in the like, hey, me and my three friends just got together. We started a company. We're looking to like you know get involved as a validator in Lido. We're looking to try to qualify. Uh, there's there's a variety of small and mid tier validators that are trying to get voted into Lido. And by means of uh, increasing their chances, they're spending a lot of time with Obel and DVT to make sure that they're proficient and that make sure that they're educated by it. Um, so honestly, there, there's a lot of really good inertia at the smaller end of the validator of embracing DVT and like using it to advance themselves so they can become more professional. Uh, and this has surprised me. Uh, this is not, you know, uh, like, a, a, like a segment that, that I thought would be such a core user and like pusher of the protocol. But I think it's really like a, it's a sign of like the ethos of Ethereum. It's, it's like kind of crazy to see actually, right? Like that group of people feels empowered to go build companies. So that's what they're doing. And then they're using Opal as a further like empowering mechanism to achieve those goals. Uh, and it's quite fascinating. So... In the Ethereum roadmap, we have this uh, this dank sharding co concept that's coming in where essentially these validators will end up becoming responsible for data availability. So if you have like a single centralized validator, it's kind of probably easy to understand. We have to store some some kind of data on our side. But how does it interact with an overall cluster where there might be three like three different 
validators. Does the data now need to be replicated across all three? Good, uh, really niche technical question, Mayor. Um, so on this, dank sharding is coming out in two phases. The first one being proto dank sharding and the second one being full dank sharding. Um, in proto dank sharding, they don't go to the extreme where they don't have every node in the blockchain kind of keeping and gossiping like all the data availability. It's still, you know, everyone sends everything everywhere. Um, ev eventually with, you know, full dank sharding, you're signing data availability witnesses to prove that, yes, you know, I did see this data. It was available. Um, oh, yeah. Over the longer run, um, there starts to be, you know, trust assumptions between the the four nodes. Trust is a strong word, but they have to decide, did we all see this or did at least any of us see this bit of data blob so that we can include it in our block and like like sign to it? But in the near term in proto dank sharding, when it first comes in, it's more or less a best effort data availability. It's done at the consensus layer and it's not, you know, you won't be slashed for it to my understanding, or at least they're not putting, they're not going to the scenario where, you know, all nodes don't store everything, which is the first way it comes in. So yeah, when it comes in a proto dank sharding, not currently a problem. When it goes to full dank sharding, the nodes do have to say, have we really seen this? And, you know, we have to kind of prove you saw it, or as you said, if you don't trust one another, everyone see the data availability before we sign off if you want to be more cautious rather than more trusting but yeah it's um in in the near term it shouldn't be a problem and then also with proposal builder separation a lot of the complexities of dank sharding is on the builder and the proposers it kind of keeps the proposals relatively simple they just have to kind of propose the really fancy block that a builder made for them maybe i'll i'll, I'll end with kind of one of the conceptual doubts I have with this entire Ethereum L2 roadmap, which is that sometimes I feel that we, meaning like we the validators and like you all of these middleware builders, we spent so much time and effort building various products to make the Ethereum validation system work and be decentralized. So many thought cycles have been spent here. And now... When it comes to the question of scaling Ethereum, most of our effort is kind of, it feels useless because it's going to be scaled through the L2s. Now these L2s are going to be running sequencers and that's like a completely different kind of validation stack that's, that's being built. And like now you have now, for example, overall, instead of, reusing your work for Ethereum directly to scale Ethereum in, in L2, you now have to go and think of this new concept of a distributed sequence and you're probably going to write new software, same for us, etc. Uh, do you in some sense think your uh, all, our, all our efforts are kind of like not being wasted but by being underutilized by the Ethereum ecosystem? Yeah. Throwing me all my favorite questions, Meher, um, because I actually would, would suggest that we don't have to throw stuff away and, you know, build new software and stuff. And this um, is the idea of Ethereum equivalence that I think was kind of first coined again by Optimism. But they kind of astutely realize that if they stay as close to the Ethereum execution architecture as possible, it's easier for, you know, to gain adoption and network effects and be able to reuse all of the existing L1 stack. Um, for example, their very first kind of MVP, we'll call it, was, you know, a modified get, um, not unlike um, mevget to some extent. And then recently, or just in the coming weeks, they're moving over to Optimism Bedrock. And the main difference there is they've abstracted all of their kind of code for the Optimism kind of fraud proof game. Um, into what they're kind of calling a consensus client and they talk only through the engine API, the standard one that all of the execution clients use. And adopting this kind of standardized API for them has allowed them to go from having, you know, OP get to also having OP Aragon and ultimately probably all of the existing L1 execution clients in the Optimism world. And we recently like announced a, a blog with Figment just yesterday on distributed sequencers and the crux of the argument is exactly, um, yeah, L2s have already kind of competed on Ethereum equivalents at the ex execution layer. The next step in our head is to 
add an Ethereum equivalent Beacon API to their code bases. So adopt BLS signatures, adopt that API, dumb it down a little. It doesn't need attestations because it's not a proof of stake game, but just have you know proposals using that standardized API. And the benefit of that is you do get to reuse more or less everything from the L1, particularly from the L1 staking side. The ones probably most important is the private key management side of things. So, you know, private keys are always the most important thing. So if you, if let's say Optimism for simplicity, they add a Beacon API to their L2, like OP node stack, they can reuse Web3 Signer, they can reuse Dirk and, you know, the benefit for Oval is they can reuse distributed validators because it uses the same API and they can more or less use it all out of the box. So yeah, I hear where you're coming from being like, should L2s really invent the wheel? And I, I agree with you, they probably shouldn't. They should you know, copy the L1 APIs as much as possible and then they get to kind of tap into the network effects of code that's already built and already been used. So yeah, our pitch to them is you don't have to do all of the decentralizing sequencer work yourselves. You can keep it a little simpler, have it be kind of a round robin thing with BLS signatures, but then use distributed validators to actually go from, you know, 10 entities in round robin to actually 10 distributed sequencers in round robin um, type of setup. So yeah, I, I, I agree that, you know, L2, is, I think, you know, generally will adopt this. They, they kind of see the network effects, trying to build something new and convince everyone to come use your stuff is hard, trying to, you know, stay aligned with existing APIs, more work for them, but, you know, more network effects and easier adoption for their customers and for everyone else. Right. So actually, actually, this then seems very powerful for the Obol network that you can effectively go to an L2 that has, let's say, a centralized sequencer. And maybe your product is simply that instead of now this being a centralized sequencer, it's actually distributed across five parties or six parties. And then if they can work out how to go from one centralized sequencer to five, and each of them now is an OBOL validator with like five or seven, then you can autom easily get to 25 or 35 people running the infrastructure. Exactly. Right. So so all of your work done for Ethereum kind of, um, yeah, scales, like probably is more useful on the L2 layer then maybe or even on the Ethereum mainnet, like that could be a future for uh, uh, that could happen for the overall project. Yeah, that was actually something I also pitched where sequ like in the L1 is normally very small machines and there's technically, you know, 500,000 validators, but sequencers, they often will be running like very large machines. So, you know, five very large machines running a distributed sequencer setup makes a lot of sense rather than, you know, thousands of small machines, the L2s mostly won't optimize for like running on consumer hardware they're you know meant to be a scaling solution but they do want to be you know as trust minimized as possible so yeah big sequencers that are run in a distributed validator type of setup where if one of them becomes malicious nothing happens they just you know like stay online like a multi-sig is it's yeah as I, I actually agree i think it nearly makes more sense at l2 than l1 um bar just the maturity side of things perfect yeah, awesome. Yeah, we went very deep. Uh, thanks so much for a dank episode, Ocean and Colin. And yeah, thanks for, for coming on to Epicenter. Maybe, yeah, before we wrap up, uh, you want to shout out uh, where people can learn more about Obol or, or, yeah, how they can find you. And yeah, again, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you guys for having us. It's It's been a great discussion. Um, yeah, to find out more about Obol, best place to probably link into the communities through Twitter. You can just find us at Obel Network, and uh, we have a cool ambassador program. We have a great Discord. We we just well tomorrow we're actually launching our research forum uh, with the distributed sequencer piece as, as the first one for, for people to get some debate on, and then we'll actually build out the Cosmos section of the research forum. So I think you guys are interested in getting involved there. Um, in the next well, this is probably, well yeah in the coming days um, you'll be able to see it. Um, and yeah, I'll pitch to Oshin, but. Thank you guys for having us and really appreciate it. Yeah, um, nothing major to add. Thank you very much. This has been super fun to talk in the nitty gritty of validators because normally we don't get to talk about, you know, bare metal versus cloud versus Cosmos or L2 and their architectures. So I'm going to be uh, grateful of this chance for to get really into the technical nitty gritty in podcasts. I hope they're all as technical as this one. <laughs>